Good evening, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. Juneteenth is the oldest celebration of the ending of slavery in the United States. President Abraham Lincoln signed into effect the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862, but it wasn't until June 19, 1865, that Union Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Texas to proclaim the end of the Civil War and demanded the release of those who had remained enslaved. Until then, for 243 years, it was legal for people in this nation to own other people. Days after the murder of Rayshard Brooks, weeks after the murder of George Floyd, months after the murder of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, almost 65 years since the murder of Emmett Till, and more than 400 years after the first Africans were enslaved on American soil, here we are still fighting for freedom. Racism isn't new. It's so American that when we protest it, people think we're protesting America or disrespecting the flag. We've been called the N-word. We've been called monkeys. I've personally been told to go back to Africa, a place I've never even visited yet. Our humanity, our pain tolerance, even our intelligence have all been questioned, merely because of the amount of melanin in our skin. Which brings us to tonight's topic we'll be discussing colorism in the black community. All over the world, we've seen or heard stories about blackface issues, right? And a lot of people are bleaching their skin. There's a popular Malay folklore that tells the story of a lady who was cursed by an evil spirit, making her skin pitch black and giving her features that only black people would have, right? Wider nose, red lips, etc. And at the end of the story, she regains her beauty, which means her skin tone became lighter. You know, the hierarchy of skin color from black to brown, from dark skinned to light skinned, it has long been a source of division. And as a result of that, skin whitening products have become a multi-billion dollar industry in West Africa 
the Caribbean, Latin America, and even here in the United States. Tonight, our panelists will be addressing this issue and share with us some of their experiences. My name is Ted, and you're watching The Drop Mic. Without any further delay, guys, um, I'll have the panelists introduce themselves. They can tell us their name, where they're from, where they live, what they do, or whatever they want to share with us. Um, I'll start with you. Um, I'll start with you, Juliet. You've been on the show before. Welcome back. Please tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Once again, uh, my name is Juliet Nelson. I am originally from New York. I currently reside in the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia metropolitan area. Um, I work for the federal government during the day as a business alliance specialist. And in the evening time, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Junuri. Um, and I am also a published author. My book is Sharing My Lens, The College Experience which is just a guide on some tips that I wish I had going into college. Once again, I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. And next, I believe we have Clotter. Hi everyone, my name is Clotter. Um, I was primarily raised in Haiti for 15 years and I currently live in Massachusetts. I am a professional and education fields. I primarily work with um, study abroad students and international students. And in the evening, um, I'm a Latin dancer. Um, and I'm really excited to be on this panel. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Claude. And I'll go to you, um, Gaina. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Gaina. Um, I guess I should say I'm originally from Jamaica. I, know, I, I don't know if you might hear a slight accent. Um, what else about me? I live in the DMV area. I live in DC, actually. Um, I work as a program support specialist for a DC government agency. I have no other evening things doing apart from watching TV. Um, I just finished my MBA. It was very expensive, so I should mention it. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you guys today. Thank you, Gaina. Congratulations, also. Oh, thank you. And next, we have Natalie. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Clerger. I am a certified life coach. I am a mother to a five-year-old little girl. I work for the state of Massachusetts as a case manager. I was also born and raised in Massachusetts. In the afternoon, I am an entrepreneur to multiple businesses. I'm always looking for partnership and excitement and learning. So I am actually thrilled to be here. Thank you, Ted, for having me. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. And last but not least, we have Dorothy. 
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dory Lee. I am from Ghana. I currently live in Millbury, Massachusetts. Um, I work in healthcare operations in Worcester and uh, I'm excited to be part of this discussion. All right, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And so I have my first question. I believe I can ask that to you, Juliet. Do you believe that there's really social or even economic impact to someone of a darker complexion? Um, it, I think it depends on where in the world you are. I think within the United States, mm -hmm. it's more of a social impact. Um, mm. I mean, if you're black, for example, as all of we are um, on this panel, if you're black, you're black. So the economic impact, I'd say, is fairly lame. Um, in terms of social, I think that's where you might find the disparities between light and darker skin. Um, I actually lived mm. in South Korea for a year, and that's mm -hmm. where the economic disparities came in. Um, in South Korea, for find people Chinese and Korean, they're more white. Uh, um, they have your mm. South Asian, Cambodians, Filipinos, who are the, the, the darker skin, more melanated people in that area. And so they happen to face the economic disparities when they try to travel throughout Asia. Um, even within their own country, you know, I have friends from those countries and they say that, you know, the disparities also exist within their own, um, their domestic area. So honestly, I think when you're talking within a community, it's more social. Um, but, you know, across mm -hmm. different countries, when you're blending different cultures, that's where it becomes economic. Okay. Okay. So according to an article published on Time Magazine, right? It says that people with um, a darker complexion sometimes get denied or look, well, how would I say that? They wouldn't consider them for a, a position in a company, right? They would rather give it to someone of a lighter complexion. So wouldn't you say that this affects them economically? Me? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, th then in that case, yeah, I would agree that it does affect them mm -hmm. economically. I'm not saying that the economic disparities don't exist at all, um, mm -hmm. especially because I haven't had that type of experience. For me, I was okay. either the only black person. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, within my family, me, the lighter skinned person in the family, I happen to be the minority. So growing up, okay. I thought, you know, darker skin was more superior. Um, I will say, you know, I do agree with you um, in the sense that, you know, you always hear that people say not to put your picture on your LinkedIn or your monster or your career builder profile because when they see how you look or how dark your skin is, that's where they may be less than likely to hire you. So in that case, yes, mm -hmm. I would agree. I don't think it's to the extent as... Um, you know the the social the social stigmas that exist in my perspective okay okay so what about you clutter have you experienced any of this form of discrimination growing up um i would definitely say so and more on the side of um not family but friends mm -hmm. of family uh growing up yeah. I especially remember how um, my sister was favored over me in certain instances, just certain comments that stuck to me till this day. Mm. And it definitely did affect my self-esteem growing up because I've always um, compared myself to my sister in the sense of, well, she's mm. lighter. That means that she's prettier. So I should probably look a little bit more like her in order to be seen in a certain light. And it's not until I moved to the US and I kind of started, you know, looking at myself differently and say, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't have then 
I shouldn't have gone to that stage to feel that I'm pretty, you know, at that very specific moment, but it, it happened. And it's not until I was in that situation that I really started appreciating my skin tone and who I was. But looking back at why I felt that way, it definitely was um, the environment that I was within. On the side of my parents, it never really happened. If anything, my dad would always get aggravated when we were talking about mm. um, skin color. My dad is a dark skin male. My mom, I would say, would be, I wouldn't say that she's fair skin, but she's not light skin either. So they never really made that comparison mm -hmm. um, between us. So it really came from the outside. Mm, okay. So what about um, the remaining of the panel? Have you guys so, experienced any of that? So I find it interesting, Claudia, that you say that because um, so I, I think from the looks of it, I'm probably the lightest person on the panel, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. just by default. Um, <laughs> and I have very, how can I say this, European features. Um, mm -hmm. Growing up, actually, um, I can relate to you, Juliet. I was actually the black sheep in my intermediate family. Um, mm -hmm. And growing up, I honestly always felt like the black sheep. Growing up, I always felt ugly. Um, I always felt like, you know, because of the color of my skin or the way that I look, that people didn't take me seriously. Like they overlooked me or downplayed me because you know, of my skin color or how I look. Um, and I always felt like I had to fight so much harder to prove myself to my surroundings because of the way I looked. And I don't know if that was something that was just, you know, within my immediate family that I could feel, but um, within my environment also, I always felt like I had to try 10 times harder because I don't know, my looks always diminished my uh, my intellectual abilities. I always felt like I had to, um, I don't know, I, I just always felt like I've had to fight 10 times harder to prove to my family that I am not what they may think of me, but I am more. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like it was because of the looks. So I kind of had that same reality, just in a different way. <laughs> Mm, okay. What about you, um, Gaina? Um, I actually have the inverse um experience of Clutter. Uh, mm -hmm. growing up in Jamaica, I was kind of admired in a sense. You know, brown skin girl, brown mm. in Wagwan, come here, let me talk to you, <laughs> something like that. Just like <laughs> attention wise. And then when I moved to mm -hmm. um, Massachusetts for college, it was like. I was I was in the weeds, you know. There was no attention at all, um, mm. and you know, and it didn't help that I well, my best friend is lighter skin, and you know she's Jamaican as well, and I felt like all, always mm. like we were being compared like the two Jamaican girls, and you know I always felt like they liked her better, and I was just kind of mm. brought along because well we can't have one without the other. And I kind of had to mm. check myself and my own insecurities and kind of, you know, um, kind of check it because I, I didn't want to get to a place where I was resenting her because of the attention that she got, in my view, mm. um, and mm -hmm. not seeing it for what it really is, you know? Um, so yeah. that was that was an eye-opening experience and I kind of had like, uh, I almost had some like insecurities in a sense cuz i'm like well why is no one talking to me why am i why am i always being like why i always feel like the 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 left behind or the the afterthought in the situation um you know mm. but yeah <laughs> okay you um, and what about sorry you, I, i'm sorry oh yeah go ahead Natalie. sorry can I chime in on with, um, sorry, Ghana? Gaina. Gaina? Gaina. Sorry, Gaina. Yeah. What you said actually put a light bulb on 
Um, because personally, when I travel to Haiti, to my parents' country, I it is much, much different from when I'm in the U.S. You know, I, you get showered with attention because of the way you look and you're glorified. And it's like everybody's at your mercy just because of the way you look. Um, so you did mention a good point, like when you were in Jamaica versus when you're here. I mean, it clicked a light bulb. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So go ahead, Dorothy. If we could um, visit the question <laughs> We can revisit the question. Um, we're just talking about personal experience, experience, right? With, um, yeah, personal experience. Okay. Well, for me, my family, we're relatively around the same um, complexion. I'm, I'm like the lightest one in my family. Um, but as far as like the environment I grew up in, everyone was pretty... Um, I grew up around Ghanaian, so uh, very rich in color, rich in light. So um, I didn't have a lot of those experiences when I felt that someone of a, a lighter complexion, just because of their complexion, they were, um, I don't know, they were getting a, a better slice of the pie. Um, I do have an experience in uh, elementary school, maybe third or fourth grade. I remember one of the students, she was also a black girl and she made a comment and she was saying that I'm, I'm blacker than the street, whatever that means, right? So like <laughs> even at that young age, you kind of know that that's not a compliment. So I think personal experiences for me is more of like, um, subliminal types of situations that were kind of uh, unconsciously aware that being dark skin is not preferable or not being light skin is somewhat of a disadvantage. So that's my personal experience in, in regards to uh, being a brown skin or dark skin woman. Mm. Okay. And I mean, so according to, um, the New York Times, they published an article saying that in certain countries in Western Africa, right, up to about 70% of women are using lightning cream. Right? But then again, you have this message of your black is beautiful and all of that, right? Black lives matter, especially right now. So do you guys think that young women are receiving or getting mixed messages from society? Can I I'll speak on that? Yet, and then... Oh yeah, go ahead, Gaina. Go ahead, Gaina. <laughs> yeah, because I, I would love to kind of speak on that because um, I consider Jamaica mm -hmm. like the, the bleaching cream capital of the Caribbean, if, if not the whole mm. Western hemisphere. Um, ble bleaching is prevalent in Jamaica. Um, and it's done mm -hmm. for a, a, a various amount of reasons. Um, the top ones being to attract a mate um, and to have a socioeconomic advantage. Um, in Jamaica, your the way that you look, your color is tied to your class and your um, your socioeconomic position in in, in life. Um, lighter people tend to have more of the money they tend to have more of the opportunities they tend to have more of the businesses they tend to get further in life in jamaica um there have been cases where you know um if you have the wrong street address you don't get a job if you look the wrong way mm. you don't get a job if you just so bleaching is like a way of life it's in our it's in the culture right now in terms of popular culture with rc's like vibes cartel like making it very very popular um going from past my shade to Natalie's shade because of bleaching mm -hmm. you know um so it's really ingrained in there um and yes the messaging is that you have to be lighter to, to, um, to attract people. You have to be lighter to get, you have to have the right look to get where you want to be in life, especially in Jamaica. That's, there's, it's kind of shifting, but the shift is very, very slow. It is like wake, waiting for another earthquake. 
and not knowing when it's gonna come like it's really really like landslide erosion slow about how it's gonna how it's shifting um yeah yeah it's it, the messaging is there okay. it's so i think it's so sad you guys um just listening to everything because mm -hmm. it's like i grew up and it, not until now do I have the confidence that I have in myself because I know better? But I always felt like I grew up with women who didn't have the same, you know, didn't have the same um, skin color as me, and I was always fighting to prove, like, you know, I'm no better than you, like, you know, I'm not this, I'm not that, because I always got the hate. Like, I always felt hated because of my skin tone. You see, what I, 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 I was, I was born in America. I was raised in America, and my skin tone personally didn't make a difference until I left the United States to go overseas. Then I was like, oh, you know, my skin color matters. But growing up, I always felt like, you know, the hatred. Like she looks this way, so you know what I mean. Let's not, she, like, it's all like all this prejudgment, um, and so it's, it's interesting. So interesting hearing these sides. <laughs> wow. I'll try it. And, um, um, I know in my experience, once again, working in South Korea, um, whitening cream is a huge thing. Um, I have been gifted whitening cream by one of my students. And I had to kind of regroup because it's a part of their culture. And they're probably just giving it to me because that's all they know. I have met Korean students with my brown skin color walking into class with a face full of white. Um, and they know good and well, that's not them. Um, but when I think about it, it, you know, I know we have this whole black is beautiful movement and so on. And so we have to keep it that systemic racism, just the progress that it's made, it's very, very new. And so therefore the idea of black being beautiful, it is still new. Um, I've had this conversation with people, um, a couple of individuals who argue more of the humanity issue um, or the human rights issue before the color issue. And so just for some historical context for viewers who don't know, um, all of the racism and, and the bias and stuff like that, that started as a color issue, especially in the United States. Um, and this is something I've been very passionate about. Um, there's a man called William Lynch and he was from the West Indies and he came to the Americas and he wrote a letter to all the slave masters. In our terms, he put a Facebook post, a Twitter thread, an Instagram post, sent it all to the, the white slave masters. And he said, I know a system that will keep the slaves in slavery for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And what y'all need to do is divide the slaves up based on long hair, short hair, uh, curlier hair, coarse hair, lighter skin, dark skin. And that's how you have house slaves and the field slaves. And basically, you the, the goal was for slave masters to turn us against each other so that we trust no one but our slave masters. And in that sense, uh. we would be mentally enslaved for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, and I also want to remind everyone that even the Bill of Rights, the, the basis on which this country was founded, right? that all of our other countries in the Caribbean and so on and so forth kind of followed suit on because, you know, we it was all the same common enemy, the, it's the, the European colonists. Um, that was based on, uh, on the premise that white skin was superior to dark skin, right? The justification for us working, our ancestors working under the sun for 12, um, 14 hour days was because they justified the fact that our melanin could handle working under the sun for those long amount of hours. And so when you see uh -huh. issues with um, bleaching of skin and so on and so forth, and even the association with um, lighter people being in higher, uh, more like in elite social classes in the Caribbean, especially, that's because 
most likely they are the descendants of a, a, a slave owner and a slave, right? Which causes a mulatto, and then there you get, you know, the lighter skin um, descendants. We even have that, you know, in the Dominican Republic in Puerto Rico, where you know, as a Haitian, they try so much to separate themselves from us. Um, my roommate, who was Puerto Rican, for, uh, for many years, you know, she thought that straight hair was more superior. She felt like her curly hair was ugly. That was ingrained in her by her grandmother. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have wow. to keep in mind that even when we say black is beautiful and so on and so forth, this is a system that has indoctrinated our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, many of whom are still alive, you know, who still carry the same mentality that light skin is more superior, white skin is even more superior. Um, And we also have the descendants, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, um, you know, in today's day that are descendants of slave masters who still carry that mentality that their skin color, their white skin is more superior. So of course it's natural that, you know, there might be somewhat of a conflict between this, my black skin is beautiful versus the light skin and white skin is still preferable. So I just wanted to Mm. share that. There's one thing you said, Juliet, that I thought was really interesting, though. Um, you mentioned that in Korea, some of the people would walk with, um, what do you say, white face? White and cream. White, it's not white face. It's whitening so, cream. Why was it? It's almost synonymous to bleaching in Jamaica. And so it's part of, oh, really? in Asia, they're, they're mm-hmm. at, at least in South Korea especially, they're, they put a lot of emphasis on aesthetics. The image, you know, um, how you look, how you present yourself um, yeah. is extremely important. And so a lot of makeup companies, especially since whiter skin is promoted, they promote, mm-hmm. you know, like a moisturizer, but a lot of them have skin whitening properties in them. And so many people as part of their makeup or face washing regimen, they're going to put yeah. skin white on. And so, you know, even someone who's as dark as I am, they don't they don't know how to accept that their skin color is okay. And remember, when you look this dark, if you're not from Africa or if you're not considered, you know, African American, in in which case they consider us as exotic, right? Um, you know, yeah. I've had people think I was rich because I changed my hair so much because they don't understand how we can afford to have straight hair one day and afro the next day, braids the next day, you know, and a, a wig, you know, or, you know, extensions, they don't get it. So they think that, you know, we're flowing with milk and honey, you know, but for Southeast Asians who do have more melanin and they, they look more Asian, they probably don't want to be associated with those Southeast Asians because that reminds them of, you know, a lower status or being poor. Of course, you know, Cambodia, wow. the Philippines, Vietnam, those are more of the the lower, the, the, the lesser developed countries in Asia as compared to Korea, Japan, China. Um, so that's where you'll find that there's more of this obsession to look whiter because it associates you with being high class, richer, um, and it, and you know you just fit the status quo. So that's that's where the whitening cream comes in. Oh. I promise y'all, I didn't use that whitening oh. cream though. I threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, um, Dorothy, you spent some time in Korea as well, right? Did you experience that? I did. Um, I was in Korea I, in 2016. I was in Korea for about seven months. I was teaching at a hagwon. So I definitely, um, mm-hmm. I. Um, I resonate with what Juliet is saying. And even, not even bleaching cream, something as simple as like foundation. Like you can see that they're wearing a shade that is lighter than them, but there's that intrinsic desire to look a certain way. And even their makeup shades, because people don't realize this, but as Juliet mentioned, there's a wide, um, 
as far as complexion, a wide range in Asian countries. But what we see mm -hmm. from what they are showing us publicly is that if there is this one tone and that tone is oftentimes very pale. So even within their country, those who are darker, they don't get basic things such as their own foundation shade. So it's, it's pretty intense over there. And um, they're definitely working towards um, expanding their views, but to live in a society like that, they will fetishize a foreigner. Like mm -hmm. when I went there, they were amazed with my skin, but they would never want to be yeah. that skin tone. So mm -hmm. it's kind of oh. a disconnect as far as what they see other people who have a dark skin, they mm -hmm. are in awe of it. But when it comes to their own, it's like a, it's something that is not desirable whatsoever. And um, I just kind of mm -hmm. wanted to go back to the whole Black Lives Matter and the, you know, my, you know, my black is beautiful. It also has a lot to do with definitely the psychological aspect of slavery and also what's prevalent and what we see in our media, what the images that are um, shown to us from the time we start watching TV or start um, uh, partaking in social media, we see a certain image of what beauty is. And it's hard. It's, it's hard for your subconscious to uh, let that stuff go. We pick that thing, we pick it up, we consume it. And it, yeah. it, it definitely impacts how we see ourselves and what we see is beautiful. If you are paying attention, mm. you see that oftentimes the, the women that are put in the public light to represent black women they have a certain uh, phenotype, they have a certain aesthetic. So it's mm -hmm. the desire to have my black is beautiful. It's a wonderful thing, but it's definitely something that is going to take time because we have to disabuse ourselves of what we have been exposed to for so long is beautiful. And also it goes a lot into the black culture as well. Uh, colorism is definitely a huge thing that is oftentimes pushed to the side. Um, but yeah, I think Julia hit on some fantastic points. It's, it's, it is deep in its foundation. And although the desire for, for acceptance of all shades is there, you can definitely, it is definitely something that is almost talking out of both sides of your mouth, right? Because it's like we uphold light mm -hmm. skin, but at the same time, we are saying, oh, you know, black is beautiful. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Clutter, I know you mentioned that growing up, you know, you and your sister had that tension, right? Because of the way people treated you guys. So, how has that changed um, from when you guys made it to the U.S.? Um, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say, oh, actually, I need to backtrack. We did have, um, tension <laughs> growing up. <laughs> My sister and I mm -hmm. absolutely hated each other at some point. Um, it's only wow. when we got to the U.S. that we got significantly there. Um, mm -hmm. and I still remember certain instances when I was in school, and I think people maybe they just picked up on the fact that um, there were some kind of rivalry between both of us and they would tell me comments like, oh, you're prettier than her anyways. As a, I don't know if it was as a way of making me feel better about myself or anything, but yeah. it definitely did play in my subconscious. And until I was ready to let all of that go and I, I think the hurt wake for happening in some sense because that really brought us together. I think if I was still in that environment and I really didn't understand um, how these comments affected our relationship um, on a subconscious mm -hmm. level, I don't think that we would have ever reached a point where we could have gravitated to such a great bond that we have as sisters. Wow. wow, that's interesting. So, um, Gaina, I know you mentioned that in Jamaica, right? People use bleaching cream so they can, I mean, they bleach so they can attract a mate, right? So is it also true that darker skinned 
men or women would look for a lighter mate so that their children can look different than they do oh yeah for for sure for certain it's not just a, that's not just a thing in jamaica that's the thing i see here in the u.s as well if you've ever walked down the street and i'm sure you've seen it but you probably mm -hmm. haven't even registered it um you always see that one really really dark dark chocolate beautiful like lupita nyongo skinned woman and who she got beside her yeah a white guy right mm. um and that's because a lot of times to put it really really frank our black men don't want black dark-skinned women and um mm -hmm. mm. you know they have to kind of reach outside the the, the box and kind of look for yeah. other people and and you know sometimes they end up with people outside their race um and, and it is what it is yes in specifically in jamaica because um your skin tone kind of helps to propel you to a certain socioeconomic position uh -huh. um it would be wiser in a sense, wiser, in a sense, for you to then look for someone, if you're a dark skinned person or a darker skinned woman, someone who is lighter skinned, so your children might have a better shot in life. Sometimes, even in families, like it's positioned where, you know, a mother would say, Oh, you can't, you can't date him because he's too dark. You need somebody lighter because we need to, you know, or if, if say, say the, the child would, she has several children one of the children is a uh, lighter skin that lighter skin um mm. daughter or son might be you know kind of mm, mm, lauded on more probably giving more uh, mm. less chores probably given more opportunities mm. but they're being used especially in a poorer family they're being used as a way a, man, a way to maneuver themselves into another position um into a higher uh class where they're they're being they, they can be used to attract a per person of a of a higher class to then move up through marriage or just reproduction so um yeah it it, it, it that's i so I, mean, I have yeah go ahead so i just want us to take a step back real quick and look at the psychological aspects to this whole thing right um so my, my reality has been completely different for a light-skinned woman. Um, I grew up and my, my mother is a short, dark-skinned, beautiful woman with different mm -hmm. features than me. So I look like my father's side yeah. of the family. When I started getting older, it, it was more so like, uh, I don't know if it was her insecurities that were coming out but it was like, oh, are you ashamed that I'm your mother? And you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I was always in that position to like prove that no, like I'm not denying anybody because you're a darker shade. And if you take, mm -hmm. um, what, Guyana, I'm sorry. Gaina? Gaina. Is it Gaina? Gaina. If you take what Gaina said, say she said it's, you. It's okay. You can say the word gay. gay. Name. It's there. Just. Just acknowledge it and then add a noun. Okay. okay. If, if, if gay, um, she used the word use, like the light skinned child mm -hmm. is used to get better opportunities. There's that psychological aspect that that light skinned child is going through. So I, I, I spoke about this the other day. A light skinned uh, person is in that bubble of being in between. We're not dark enough to be black or accepted in our culture right. and we're not white enough to be accepted in the white culture so we're left in the middle to fend for ourselves and always prove i i'm 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 with the black matters movement i i i support my darker brothers and sisters i am in this then i get the backlash you don't know what it feels like you don't know what it feels like um so being light skin has a lot of <laughs> of these, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. And I always felt like uh, you guys had mentioned, like you would see brothers seeking lighter skinned women, but I always felt that mm -hmm. brothers would seek like lighter skinned women because they wanted to um, have fun 
and not really settle down. Yeah. I always think that yeah. brothers seek women that were darker because they were less appealing to the eye. Um, don't take what I said wrong, but <laughs> they were less, um, mm -hmm. they weren't as light skin, so, oh, or as favored, so a lot of men. Huh? Let me meet the, those brothers. I need to find where they are because I don't see that. But okay, girl, <laughs> let me know. Well, well, that has always. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that has always been my reality as a light skinned woman. Mm -hmm. My reality has always been that I was left in the middle to fend for myself, to try to prove myself that I was more that because the majority of my my friends and my family they were darker complexion, so I was not mm -hmm. always favored. I was always getting. I was always getting the hatred. I was always getting the subliminal mm -hmm. hatred because I looked, mm -hmm. I didn't look like them. And they had in their mind that if you're light skinned, you have all these privileges, you're this, you're that. So my reality was different mm -hmm. because I grew up hating myself for looking the way I looked. I always wanted to be darker because everybody around me was darker and I got the subliminal mm -hmm. hate. And I always felt like I was fighting mm -hmm. and fighting until this day. Now that I'm an adult and I'm more mature, and I'm, um, I'm conscious, it's more, it's, I'm always, I feel like even during this epi um, this whole epidemic and uh, pandemic um, and what we're doing with Black Lives Matter, I feel like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm advocating for myself, my brothers and my sisters, and my brothers and sisters always backlash, like, you know, you don't know what it feels like, you don't know what it feels like, oh, did you mm. get your white card revoked? And I'm like, wow. dude, <laughs> I'm in the middle. I, I am not in, in corporate America or in North America. I'm still black. I'm still black. Mm -hmm. You know, I may not be darker, but you know, sometimes you're left in that middle. And so during this movement too, light skinned people are going through this. Well, for me, I'm going through this thing like where I'm digesting everything and having to heal from that trauma because I've gotten hatred. I've gotten so much hatred where I just feel like sometimes it has gotten to the point where I just wanted to leave the black culture behind and, and completely annihilate that existence because I've gotten yeah. that much hatred for just looking the way I look, which I cannot help. So there's different realities to it. And I think sometimes we forget that the people who are light skinned and, you know, privy to be privileged and has all these extra benefits, they go through a lot too psychologically. You know, so we're yeah. all going through it. And I think Juliet was talking about how William Lynch had that plan for us to hate one another and be enslaved. And technically it has been an enslavement. You know, it has been an enslavement because we hate each other for the way we look. And, you know, we, we're, we're, we're all getting the trauma. <laughs> I hate you for how you look. You hate me for how, we, how you look. You know what I mean? It's just, we're all getting that trauma. <laughs> So I just want to add yeah, I I to, that. sorry, I just wanted to oh, add to what Natalie ahead. said. Um, I'm seeing some of the comments on Facebook um, and there's a little bit mm. of a back and forth between the fact that there are black men who um, do love dark skinned women um, versus, mm. you know, yes, that's true, but there's, you know, there is a large majority of them that don't. So to add to that mm. conversation about especially choosing a mate, um, I'm not yeah. dark skinned. However, and I'm not like light, the lightest complexion, but mm -hmm. it's almost, and um, let's put it in this way. Um, it's almost like we're objectified. I, mm. in my experiences and some of my friends as well, they might be lighter skinned and it's almost that, like they're dated, but you know, we're just an object. We're almost sexualized, mm. right? because we're lighter skin. Oh. Um, but when it comes to really choosing a mate for some, for, for many black men, um, choosing a mate that they say they're gonna raise their kids and so on and so forth, they will go with a darker skinned woman. Um, mm -hmm. And it has been my observation. This is, and this is not to put down dark skinned women because that is within their right. If you fall in love with a, a, a beautiful black woman, no matter how light or dark she is, you did well, right? If she takes care of you, she uplifts you, then you did well. 
Um, but that is a reality yeah. that when you have fairer skin or more or browner skin than darker skin, you're almost sometimes seen as an object. Like, you know, the dumb blondes, um, I, I'm sorry if they're blondes uh. on watching this. But yeah, the way they use, you know, blondes are objectified, right? Sometimes mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. the experience for light skin, lighter skin black girls. Um, I know in my experience, I've had people compare me to my darker skinned cousins. Are you jealous of your cousin because mm -hmm. she's prettier than you? Um, and wow. sometimes it felt like I was too much or I was still not good enough, right? Um, and once again, still being compared. Um, me being, you know, yes. if I speak well or I articulate myself well, I can't just be considered um, educated or someone who loves to learn. All of a sudden, I'm bougie. I think I'm better than everyone. And I can't just be yes. regarded as, you know, who likes to learn. Um, and I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I prefer not to put myself against any black woman, you know. But once again, I was raised thinking dark skin is the most beautiful thing. To the point, you know, if reincarnation were a real thing, I would want to be like one of those like black skin women. Um, because when I grew up, like my father was a dark skin man. So when I first learned about colorism, I was like, what is that? Because to me, I thought darker skinned people, you know, like motherland, they were, you know, they were the epitome of the motherland. It made them more beautiful. It made them more superior. My father's a history teacher. So history for me started from, you know, the, the genius that existed in Africa before they took them and brought them to America. So that's kind of how mm -hmm. I saw it. But even then I was still compared to, you know, my darker skinned cousins. And even when I would, I would not, I would not internalize it. And I choose not to do that. You know, I would say if they're more beautiful then they're more beautiful. You know, it makes me feel better about myself because those are my cousins. That's my flesh and blood. Yeah. So I'm proud of it, but I can completely understand the feeling of feeling like you're in the middle, um, you know, almost being criticized because you might think that you're too good because you're fair skin. But the reality is we're black, right? In history, if you are one eighth mm -hmm. back black, then you're black. That's really it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I think this speaks to an opportunity for our community to, to, to not compare our trauma to one another. Um, in the Bible, you know, God does not put degrees on pain. He does not put degrees even on the Ten Commandments. As human beings, mm. we put different levels to sin, to pain, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, a black person is a black person is a black person is a black person, right? And I think it's an yeah. opportunity for us to acknowledge that while my trauma as a brown skinned girl might not look like my cousin's trauma as a darker skin, you know, or my father's trauma as a dark skinned man, we've all gone, gone through some pain. Even in, once again, Hispanic communities, we have people in the Dominican Republic who don't want to associate them with the people who are the reason for their freedom to begin with. Okay, mm -hmm. and honestly, if they're Dominicans watching the show, I say what I say, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> honestly, honestly, it's an opportunity for us to say, you know what, our Hispanic brothers and sisters, the reality is they have African roots, just like we do. Maybe yeah. they're mixed in a little bit more with the colonizers and with other, other, um, other cultures that might make them fair skin. However, they are still subject to bias. They're still subject to racism. And it might not look like what we're going through, but it's still pain. And until we acknowledge that everybody's in pain and that even if we can't understand each other's pain, it's still pain, we can't move past this whole colorism thing. Okay, okay. Um... Is everything okay, Natalie? That you spoke earlier, yes. But I'm just thinking about my trauma growing up mm -hmm. as a light-skinned woman until this day. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe because my environment, 
I, you guys, I was not taught to love myself at all. At and you're all. absolutely beautiful. That's the first person and, you touched. You are absolutely beautiful. Thank you, but it it took a long time for me to not look at myself like why do I look like this? Like, God, why did you make me beautiful? Because I feel like men just wanted to, you know, they didn't, no, I don't want to, you know, it, I wasn't taken seriously because I was light skinned you know? And I had, mm. it just, it, it, the, just the trauma of the hatred all my life growing up and until this day, like the prejudgment and um, if I'm around my black brothers and sisters, I was, you know, it's like, oh, you talk like a white girl. Oh, you know, you're bougie or you're this, mm. you're that. And it's like on those stairs. And I'm just trying to fit in. You know what I mean? I'm just trying mm -hmm. to fit in. And all, yeah. you know, all those things, like they stay in my, they, they're just traumatic incidents. And when you have your brothers and sisters who are darker than you looking at you in a certain type of way and just hearing you guys speak and, and like, you know, replaying my reality, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like the, 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 the trauma that had happened in my life, you know what I mean? And it's not until now, like I said, you guys, and thank goodness for me, um, not it, even if I was a dark skinned woman, um, my daughter is the same complexion as me. So there's no like, mm -hmm. there won't, you know what I mean? she could probably relate to me or like, you know, we can break that general pattern, that generational curse. And I don't even know if my yeah. environment, the women that brought me up even knew consciously that they were giving me so much hatred for the way that I looked. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad because yeah. in, in our society and being enslaved and having us hate each other, no woman should have to be raised to hate themselves, to not know what beautiful is. And maybe because the people that raised me were different than me and they didn't want me to realize or, you know, I couldn't realize how I was beautiful as a person. It didn't matter if I was white or dark, but because they got so much hatred for being dark skinned girls, you know, and I became, I was the light baby. I, the hatred passed on to me. You know what I mean? So I had to fight and yeah. break my way out of that pain and trauma to, to the point where it's like, I don't even want to associate with those people because they, 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 they trigger that within me. So, you know, the whole colorism thing within our, within our culture is, is, is deep. You know, it's really, really, really deep, especially if somebody has done the work or starts doing the healing and starts you know, recognizing their generational, their patterns or different things, you know, you, it, it, it hurts. It's not yeah. easy, you know, it's time where we're fighting for Black Lives Matter. And I, I have to tell this to my boss, I've been advocating for it. There's so much trauma that we have to break through. The generational yeah. trauma, it's deep. Yeah. It's deep, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a joke, it's not. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, and I know the way you feel, there are so many other people that, fit, that share your, um, your experience, right? And I remember when we were meeting to discuss the topic for tonight with, um, you know, the, the staff for Drop Mic, I know Sephora, she mentioned something similar. You know, growing up in Haiti, she didn't really benefit from, well, I mean, I have to say that she's light-skinned, right? But growing up, she wasn't praised or given special attention or privileges because of her skin color, right? Instead, people would hate on her, you know, give her names and things like that. So I definitely do understand that a lot of people definitely share your frustration and it's something that we definitely have to address as a community. Absolutely. You know, um, I would like but, to say that in regards to like what's yeah. been said, there's definitely mm -hmm. a attention, and I think a lot yeah. of that is it's a defense mechanism because although mm -hmm. 
I don't think anyone can say uh, rightfully that being light skin is, you know, you don't have any problems, you don't have any worries, because everyone has problems and worries. I think a lot of the tension and the um, the aggression comes from seeing that I, as a dark skinned woman, am not represented in the same way as uh, other uh, black women. So when we see those images in the media, when we see who people yeah. are drawn to, who's lifted up and lifted high, there does create mm -hmm. an animosity. So mm -hmm. I, I read somewhere online, like the difference between being called an African booty scratcher and somebody mm. calling you cinnamon toast crunch or something we have different struggles and that doesn't mean yeah. one struggle does not outweigh the other but i think mm -hmm. in regards to what people call light skin privilege is that a lot of the times the whatever kind of aggression that is faced towards you is not mm -hmm oftentimes is not um, in a way that demeans you and your and, and your beauty and who you are. Um, if we look through historical history and media, dark skinned people are uh, character, like become character, caricatures, I can't say that word, of mm -hmm. like animals, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whenever mm -hmm. it's depicted as the angry uh, black woman, and it's, it's not always mm -hmm. very, more so than often, it's of a dark skinned woman. If we look at the shows yeah. that are on primetime television, we have a, a beautiful, what's her name, Yara. She's stunning. Like, who doesn't love her? But she's representing black women. And a lot of black women don't look like that. But a lot of the times in the world that we live in, when a representation of us is set forth, it's always presented in that kind of you know, light skinned. Um, uh, uh on, on on the plate of a light skinned person and uh that mm -hmm. animosity where somebody can just dislike you for the color of your skin because you're lighter than them it's it's just it is it stems from the fact that they see your image on on they see your image but they don't see theirs so it's wrong mm -hmm. of course but it's coming from some place that is substantive and um, yeah. I think that's what I'm just gonna leave it there because the, the experiences are completely different because my, my dark skin, when it is, it, when it is comment on, commented on, it's often in a, well, you're lucky, you know, you look good for a dark skinned mm -hmm. girl. Like that's a compliment. That's a compliment that is thrown here and there. Like that is a common thing that is said. And what yeah. that is referencing is that dark skinned women are not, they're not cute, they're not beautiful. So the fact that you made it out of there looking, you know, a little bit decent, you should be, you know, you should be thankful. So that's a lot of the, wow. that's a lot of, of what dark skinned women get. Right. And I think that in order for that kind of division to somewhat decrease, I think that light skinned women have to be advocates for dark skinned women. Because I think a lot of the time. You said times, it, girl. That's it. <laughs> a lot That's of the times, time. it's like light skinned women benefit from the praise. And when. Uh, um, a dark-skinned woman is being demeaned for their looks, for just simply being the color that they are. There's, there's nothing mm -hmm. coming from our light-skinned sisters, brothers and sisters. So it's like people see that, people internalize that. So they have come to the conclusion that this individual is no law, is not an ally of mine. So the way mm -hmm. that they express that may be. Uh, bullying of some sort, you know, and that's yeah. wrong as well. Yeah. But this, as the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. So I mm -hmm. think that in no way diminishing the struggle of the experiences that you people have had as light skinned women feeling as if, you know, they have to kind of they don't have a, a place to stand in. They don't belong to one group or the other. I believe a lot of that is 
the often silence of light-skinned women when uh, dark-skinned women are being, uh, once again, are, are being downplayed. And the fact that we also don't yeah. see ourselves the way that you see ourselves as rep as representation goes. It's getting better for sure, but it, it, it's, it's a long way to go. So I think advocacy but, for one another, but I put the onus on light-skinned women the most, is that although there are struggles in that camp, no no lie, mm -hmm. the, the, the historical struggle of the dark-skinned woman is one of that that I don't fit. Society has literally rejected dark-skinned women. So it's let me, a uphill, let me, can I I don't uphill climb. Go ahead. I, I want to interject, it if, I, if I may. Not, I want to say, it is, not, it is not the responsibility of a light-skinned woman to do anything. Why is that I, not? I think it is. Because just like, we just have, like it is the responsibility you know, let me, of let white people to talk about racism, point. it is the responsibility of light-skinned people to, 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 to advocate for dark-skinned women. I think it is. I let think, me just finish it, my point. Oh, let's sure. let's let's hear from Natalie. Let's hear from Natalie, guys. I I was in a situation where I had mm -hmm. narcissistic people upbringing me that didn't look like me. Yeah. So I struggled all my life to prove to them that I love them. <laughs> you cannot sit. Nobody is entitled to do anything for anybody <laughs> because I was put in a position where my upbringing i had to fight all my life i'm talking about fight to prove i care and that they matter to me and that they have a significance now if it's if it's i i, I don't mind advocating for somebody I, could, I tell my brothers and sisters that they're beautiful all the time because I'm the only light skinned one. I always hear, I'm always telling them. They never tell me because they think that I think I'm beautiful. And so therefore, mm -hmm. I'm always the one put in the position trying to prove to them. Yeah. So it's a very thin line between saying that it's a responsibility of a light skinned woman to do something. Everybody has their, like you guys, their I, own trauma, their I own past. Before you speak, Dorothy, before um, you speak, Dorothy, if I may. Ladies. Um, go ahead, Gaina. Oh, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Can I go ahead? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, Natalie, I, I, I empathize with you. I, I understand where you're coming from. And don't think that myself or Dorothy are even saying that your struggle um, that you went through personally as your own being is not relevant or it's not significant. I think mm -hmm. what Dorothy was trying to, to harp on was that it is not, I, I don't wanna say common, but it's not what we see, right? It is not, what is being brought to the forefront a lot. Um, again, this is not saying that your struggles that you went through growing up are not relevant and they're not significant. No one is saying that. Um, I think we need to understand that, um, again, darker skinned women are disproportionately left behind. They're not... Mm -hmm. We don't see them in media, how they've been treated um, historically, um, as Juliet kind of mentioned um, earlier in, in this whole thing, um, in terms of dark skinned women being out in, in the fields and light skinned women being in, in the house as, as house slaves and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And yes, of course, a dark skinned person pitting their anger onto you as a lighter skinned person because of all these different plights that they have, have to go through it's not great it's not it's not right it's not great but we would be remiss to not acknowledge that lighter skinned women do have 
privilege yeah. and they do have some advantages maybe you personally did not feel those advantages and so you cannot relate but that doesn't mean that in the wider and broader scope that this privilege doesn't exist now as i was yeah. saying before if it is the responsibility of white of, of white people because they built this um system of racism to then dismantle it right because lighter people lighter skin people benefit more from the system of colorism it is therefore mm -hmm. There is my responsibility because some people do see me of a lighter skin complexion, right? To then yeah. dismantle it. I need to, you know, look out for my darker skin sisters. I need to watch what I'm saying. I'm saying I need to check myself because I love me a dark skin man. Oh my God. I love, oh, I want I, I need to check myself. Amen. Hello, so somebody. I'm not criticizing. <laughs> that dark skin chocolate six five brother over there and make sure like oh do i like him because i like him or do i like him because he's dark you know what are you feeling right now right um uh, right that so no one is saying your experience isn't is it relevant no one is saying that your experience i am so sorry that you went through that i'm so sorry that you had your family, the people who are supposed to look out for you and guard you and, and protect you, treat you in, in that way. And girl, we need to have a conversation outside of this, but in the broader scope, in the broader scope, the, the wider net of everything, light-skinned women do have privilege, uh, light-skinned people, sorry, not women, I wish we had some men on the panel, but hey, um, light-skinned people do have privilege and they do, they yes pain and and we all feel pain yeah but the pain the level of pain that somebody whose lighter skin is feeling might not be at the level historically that a darker person is feeling so we have to we would be again we'd be remiss not to just acknowledge that and say this exists no i just want to say you guys um ladies I we have I to just, take a break i just wanted to say something. oh okay yeah. yeah, we have to take a break, guys. <laughs> um, and I want to remind that you're the only male on this panel, and I know you're the host. Yes. I think we're going mm -hmm. to need to hear your perspective, the male perspective on yeah. colorism. That's, that's the only thing. You never do this. <laughs> but if you yeah. think it's a holiday, talk to your producers, talk to your people. If we need to get our people to talk to your people, but we think we might need a male's perspective. Definitely, definitely. And I agree with you. Um, this is an invitation um, for our audience. If a guy is watching, the number is on the screen. After the break, this is your opportunity to call in and give us your opinion. Right? And I may give my opinion at the end of the show. You're watching Drop Mic. Don't go anywhere. An army of youth from all walks of life, dedicated and devoted to making a difference in the community. We strive to be the change that we want to see, putting our God-given talents to good use while relying on Him for guidance and strength. We do not reject tradition, we simply seek improvement by turning both strengths and flaws into assets for the Lord. 
We are heavily armed with mass construction weapons. Those of faith, hope, love, and prayer. And we are looking to impact every single individual we encounter. We are PDF Ministry. Proactive and devoted faith ministry. everybody for tuning in um, and as you guys know if you're just tuning in tonight's topic I mean tonight's discussion is uh, around the issue of colorism in black communities I believe we have a caller on the line hello um, and as you guys know, if you're just in, tonight's yes can you hear us if you could please do me a favor and put your volume down. My volume is up. One second. Yes, for your um, other device. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. My question is I'm still getting some feedback. If you have another device playing in the background, can you please put the volume all the way down? I don't have no device playing. I was watching you guys on my phone. Can you hear me better? I'm still getting some feedback. Because I have this, I'm having this looping. So. All right, go ahead. Okay, my question is for you um, as the only male in the panel. Um, can you relate to some of the stories uh, the ladies or some of the scenarios the ladies shared uh, tonight? Um, thank you for and thank you for calling um, and thank you for the question. And you say you have another question. Ted, the people want to know answer that answer. That's it. Okay, okay, thank you. The want to um, know, Ted. The I will. I will. Be, I will be addressing at the end of the episode, guys. <laughs> but I want to give our callers a chance to <laughs> yeah, we got time. to weigh in we got and give their opinions. Because I, I believe we have another caller on the line. Let's put them through. Yes, hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Mm -hmm. Ted? We can hear you. Hey, what's going on? It's Max. Hey, Max. It's Max. What's going on, man? Pretty good. Hello? That's can exciting. You, you might not have anymore <laughs> yeah go ahead max we can hear you <laughs> all right man i just have to tell you first of all shout out to everybody on the panel great job as always ted beautiful job all you beautiful ladies thanks for being on um i'm just going to touch on one topic one one part of it is which is the versus part of it i just want us to tread really lightly lightly here because man when it comes to the versus part as soon as we start the whole if the, putting the onus on a certain group versus another, then we're doing what the colonizers and the white supremacists have done, which is pit us against each other. At the end of the day, uh -huh. if we want to get ahead, we have to say, you know what? We've all been hurt. We've all been traumatized. Because the fair-skinned people have been taught to be hated by the darker-skinned people, and the darker skin, the fair skin people are looking down on the dark skin people. It happens between uh, people in Dominican Republic and Haiti, people in Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, people in Puerto Rico and Cuba. It happens everywhere. What we need to understand is let's stop this mess and let's let's undo what we saw. Because guess what? When I grew up, I was part of that life skin. I thought that oh, you know, everyone on television was Caucasian, so. I looked up to the mm -hmm. fair skin thing as well. And then as I dug and dug and I realized, man, they did this to us. And I started to look at our chocolate skin and love my own skin differently. And I started to see the beauty in our chocolate skin people. 
And so it's through education mm-hmm. and understanding. You know what? The fight against is not against one another, but against what they did. Once we understand that, then we can start the healing. We, 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 we can't go with the versus thing because that's a non-starter. People are going to be backed up in the corner, and we're not going to go anywhere. That's all I want to say. I love y'all. Y'all are beautiful. Let's go. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Um, um, I want to remind our audience that you guys can start asking questions. You can either call in or you can ask your questions on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I know, Juliet, you want to you wanna hear from me. But, uh, <laughs> You're the only question now. Part of the panel. I do want to say this one thing though. I do mm-hmm. um, because I I understand. I, I do not know what Dorothy. I do not know how Dorothy feels, and I will not try to even be disrespectful in that manner. But I validate mm-hmm. everything she says, and I also yeah. understand um, how Natalie is is, is feeling because I've had similar experiences. Uh, let's let's kind of break down the privilege thing a little bit. And let's look at different levels of it. White versus white privilege versus black privilege. When you're looking at a white rich person, they're more than likely to see that they're privileged as compared to their black counterparts, right? Because mm-hmm. um, from a social economic standpoint, we are disproportionately disadvantaged. When you're looking at a middle class, upper or lower middle class person, um, comparing themselves to an upper or lower middle class black person, they see that our struggles are the same. We're struggling to keep food on the table, we're struggling to pay the bills and so on and so forth. The, the thing that they don't see is the root of it, right? For them, uh-huh. for example, COVID-19, right? A middle class person who lost their job it's normal, you know, they just they just got the effects of what, what the pandemic caused economically. But for a black person who's been impacted, most likely there were already socioeconomic uh, roots under that, that further exacerbated their chances of being disproportionately impacted, right? So mm-hmm. what happens is they don't necessarily see uh, their privilege as compared to their black counterparts because at the surface, to them, they're equal. Now, let's go on to another level. Woman. Black woman, honestly, we are the most marginalized group. The fight for racism, civil rights, um, racial, what is civil rights, race, it, it, it didn't impact, it didn't really benefit us as much as it benefited the men. And the fight for women's rights didn't benefit us as much as it benefited the white woman. So it's almost like, and Ted, I don't know if you can say this, but like a dick, I guess. It, it goes two ways, I guess you can say. Um, so what happens is we have women who struggle, who might be the victims of the patriarchal you know, society, white women. And because black women are also victims, they don't see how privileged they are as compared to black women. Because at the surface, we seem to be the same, but under under the surface, the root of the problem is vastly different. Now, when it comes mm-hmm. to the responsibility that lighter skin or fair skinned women have, and once again, Natalie, I will never take away your trauma, and I am so sorry as my sister that you had to go through that. However, the reality is the roots of our trauma as compared to our darker skin sisters trauma they are very different and they are rooted in the same thing that caused white people to feel that their skin color was superior to even us with brown skin and so when it comes to our responsibility toward our dark skin sisters i think it does not mean that our trauma doesn't matter. It does not mean that we bury our trauma, right? Because at the end of the day, mm-hmm. our black sisters understand trauma. They understand trauma, right? And the reality is they are not represented. They're not represented in the media. 
However, if I know that as a light skinned person, and I'm not even light skinned like that, but as a fair skinned person, that it's an opportunity for me to either say what you're not about to do is talk about my dark skinned sister like that. Or, you know, I was able to get a pass for this opportunity. Uh, what happened to my dark skinned sister? You didn't see her too? Oh, so I can't get high. I, I can get hired, but she can't because why? She's too dark skinned or you're trying to come up with a reason? I'm out. I'm out. Because the reality is seeing how, you know, just hearing the pain that's that's resonating on this panel, the reality once again is that we are all in pain. And if my black sister, I've even told this to my students, if I graduate grad school and my student does not graduate high school, I have failed because I am part of her village. She can't cheer me on and say, Miss Juliet, you're great, you're smart, you're this. And then she doesn't pass. And it's the same thing with my dark skinned sister. If I get an opportunity to get ahead and she worked as hard, if not harder, and she can't get the same opportunity, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Let's hold up a second. You need to count my, my, my black sister in because her pain is my pain. No, I don't feel it the way she does, but that is our reality. When we know that we have been given a leg up, it's our opportunity to stick up for them. And I think it's almost like yeah. how uh, women advocate for men, right? And we don't get advocated the same way. I do, I have had in my experiences, even in spite of the negative backlash, my dark skin cousin, they would never ever let someone talk down to me because of my skin color. And in the same sense, I have that same responsibility for them. When you've gone through pain and you've gone through trauma, as human beings, we are naturally selfish. And this is not to be offensive. So when we go through pain and when we go through trauma, we are the only people experiencing it. Whether we're light skin, dark skin, tall, short. To us, and that's how it works, we're the only one experiencing it. And that's what causes some people to go depression and not talk to other people. That's what makes some people afraid to open up because they don't realize that other people are also suffering. It's just the pain doesn't look exactly the same, right? So there's a the level right. of validation that all of us need. Black women need that validation and they deserve that validation. Fair skin or light skin so women, me, we too need that validation. But what we also have to keep in mind is that we have one common enemy and they're the biggest that created all of this division. So once again, yes, our pain, my pain, Natalie, your pain matters. But if you are ever in the upper, in a position where you see someone with with Claudia's skin tone or with Dorothy's skin tone, and you realize that you're getting a leg up of them, and you know they were as much, if not and you have a responsibility, sis. You have a responsibility to them. And so, so let me, again, let me, let me, Julia, hold on. You have a responsibility to them. Let me, let me clarify, you guys. I am a grown, educated woman. And I, 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 I acknowledge, I know that light-skinned, there is a light-skinned privilege. I'm not oblivious to that. Mm -hmm. I know that. Um. But I think a lot of times we don't look at the deeper level of things, which is why just one little word kind of like trickled down and triggered something within me. And we have to break it down to go on a deeper level because a lot of people don't think about the perspective that I just talked about. So a lot of people don't see that perspective. That's true. A lot of people don't, don't understand that. And it is, it, I know, I know that there's light seated privilege. I know that I've, 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 I've been in it, I've, I've experienced it. Um, and, you know, sometimes that may be oblivious to a lot of things. And not until this, um, until George Floyd passed away and I was hearing a lot of stories, did I realize all the privileges that I've had but it takes another level of things too. We gotta sometimes we gotta get deeper under the surface. I am a I'm, I'm a human rights officer. I advocate for everybody. I 
there's not one day that I would ever, ever let my brothers and sisters not get an opportunity just because of the way that they look over, you know what I mean? And, and, and me get it because of the way that I look. I would never do that. You know, aside from, the, we were breaking it down to layers. I had a wonderful childhood. <laughs> I grew up in a wonderful home. But when we're when we're when we're getting down to the nitty gritty, that sometimes we don't dig mm -hmm. to the subconscious and try to heal those things. Those are the things that matter because those are the we have to be consciously aware of our subconscious. And when this whole movement started, I really sat down with myself and I thought about my life and my experiences with the white community and within my community. And I realized a lot of things that were happening. So when 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 um, Dorothy and I'm so sorry, <laughs> you're so beautiful. Don't take it wrong. Um, I wasn't trying to like go against what you were saying because it's it's valid. But the little word that have, you know what I mean? The little word that you just said, just not even thinking of anything, it triggered something within me. It made me think about the traumas that I've had, and I'm like. You know, the people like me, and I'm, I'm certain that I'm not the only one who's had these experiences or felt these things. Like Ted had mentioned, she had spoken, she had, he had spoken to somebody prior to the show starting. There's a lot of me's out there. And we're looking mm -hmm. at the bigger picture. Yes, our, our black sisters are all in this. Yes. But within our, within our culture, we have that hatred in there. And so there's a lot of light-skinned women who grew up like me. Who, who didn't, who don't see their values, don't see their worth. And therefore, when they don't see their value, they don't see their worth. And men look at them like some kind of piece of meat. And uh, a light-skinned mm -hmm. woman I know for, you know, to be, you, um, how can I say this word appropriately? <laughs> they're, 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 they're known to be promiscuous. Mm -hmm. If you dig down deeper, it comes from somewhere, right? It comes from mm -hmm. them having to be looked at in a certain looked at in a certain way and getting a certain type of attention getting used and abused and tossed to the side so a lot of women don't fit or they were they, they were raised by people who didn't make them feel beautiful or they don't know their value they don't know their self-worth and so even though they look beautiful they might be doing a whole bunch of things to glamorize their outside appearance but on the inside they're dead hmm. Wow. Seeing women on a lot of life, especially in our culture, they're they're like used as trophies. Like you know, you represent something. You have to look a certain way. You're, it's like an object sometimes, mm -hmm. and that happens a lot. And I, I think this the colorism, you guys, is, it, it's, it's deeper than just you know our our light skinned sisters have to or should advocate. Like Juliet had mentioned, it comes from a root. It comes from a root. And I think Max, the caller, had also mentioned we need to recognize that mm -hmm. amongst us, we should not be hating each other. You know what I mean? It comes yeah. from an outside source. And we need to realize that I think that's that's the pattern and the cycle we need to break. It's not necessarily, oh, you know, the, the light-skinned person has to defend their darker brothers and sisters. It's not necessarily that. I think we just have to break that subconscious pattern that, you know what I mean? Because then it puts so much burden and weight on that light-skinned person because sometimes they're walking through life not even understanding their self-worth but they're they're mm -hmm. they're like injecting worth into somebody that looks different than them do you see them i, I hope you guys see where i'm coming from with this you know i'm trying to also be the, the, the devil advocate a little bit to try to um shed light on other things that are not so commonly talked about. You know, there's there's roots to everything. You know, and 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 yeah. and I I am not gonna deny for one minute <laughs> that light skinned women do not have privileges over our darker brothers and sisters. That is, I'm not gonna invalidate that. That is a valid statement. Thank um, what I'll say to I that is, I always one say second, second, the devil doesn't need any advocate. But um, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, but that was the yeah, word that I couldn't make out. We are going to call down the line, guys. <laughs> oh, we're not letting you off the call. It's a panel of black women. We have we have a caller on the line, so let's 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 hear from them. Hello. 
-hmm. Yes, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, go ahead. Uh, am I on the show or? Yes, you're live. Go ahead. Yeah, All right. Um, okay, so uh, Obel kind of hit me up. This is himself, by the way, everybody. I hope, I hope everybody's mm -hmm. doing well. Um, so just to kind of address uh, a quick thing, because I guess you guys are looking for a male perspective. And first, kudos to the ladies. You guys have just been saying amazing things. I love all the points. Um, shout out to all of you guys. Um, I'll start off with the first aspect of, is there such thing as light skin privilege? Um, absolutely. Mm. There has to be because, you know what I mean, um, you're talking about a, a black community of black people where the number one weapon that was used against us was divide and conquer, right? So in the concept of mm. divide and conquer, you're dividing us with uh, whether it be location, resources, color, you know what I mean? So now you have the concept of the house slave where the slave that is the most compliant, the one that's less likely to cause issues is the one that gets more privileges in the house. You know what I mean? And nine times out of 10, this used to be the one that would be the lighter skin um, black, right? So that ends up happening. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is now you have the darker slaves, seeing the lighter slaves being treated a certain way, and now it creates levels of bias. And the other day I was researching this thing and it's called genetic trauma. So it means that the trauma that your ancestors went through, even though you don't go through it yourself, you still feel the effects of what happened. So now what happens is right. in our generation, we still feel the same effects that our ancestors were going through, but now it's doubled down because now we're living in a society where now every narrative that is meant to harm us or hurt us is pushed heavy. So for example, this men only like light-skinned women narrative, right? I know lots of black men that love darker women, but they're going to force this narrative. It's the same way they force the black-on-black -black crime narrative. It's the same way they force the black people are violent narrative. These are just narratives that are what? Meant to divide and conquer. I'll keep going. It's the same way that they have Martin Luther King, and they tell you that Martin Luther King is all about peace, all about peace. Why did they force that narrative? To pacify black people. They tell you that Martin, Malcolm X was super violent. Why do they give you that narrative? So you won't research him, so you won't learn how effective he actually was. And what is the point of that? Every narrative they push you, they push upon us, is meant to just get in your mind, weaken you, pacify you, and make you make us uh, incapable of uniting. So when we talk about, okay, the light skin privilege, we have to understand, this is not even something black people are forcing upon us, ourselves. This was something that was shoved down our throats. We were told we were like this, and you kept saying it so much. And you've been doing it for so long that when you've been abused for so long, mentally, emotionally, without, your even, without you even choosing it, you participate in your own abuse because it's been normalized. So now, if I'm a light-skinned person, I've been hearing my entire life that for some reason I'm more special than the darker ones. It's the same way where you have, um, you know, your Caucasian European who they necessarily don't hate black people, but they've just been told you're better, you're better, you're better, you're better. And they've been hearing that their entire life. So now when a black person steps up to them or confronts them, it's not even that they're necessarily racist. It's that their subconscious is, yo, who is this person talking to me? And so they react in the way that they've been trained. And now the reality is that it, before we can even get to the point of saying, okay, is this actually a valid thing? This is just a narrative. This is a, I, I can, we can get extra woke if we want to and say it, it's like a matrix that's been forced upon us. But the reality is, is that when you are around people who are conscious, when you're around people who are educated, who are smart, that is not the case. I'm sitting here watching all, all, all the panelists talk, and I don't get no vibe, no vibe that you guys feel like a light skin is smarter or greater than someone who will be darker. Why is that? Because we're educated, because we're not feeding into the narrative. You know what I'm saying? So when you operate in a system where you're just allowing yourself to be force fed, then you're going to believe things like Thomas Jefferson was a great man and slavery actually really ended and all of these things that we're fed, but it's just straight up lies, right? And then now, now let's continue to add context to certain things. 
even now, we continue to become um, puppets of our conditioning. So when we look at the Rosa Parks situation, Rosa Parks wasn't the only woman that sat on the bus. The other lady was Claudette Cloven. But why did they put Rosa? Because they say Rosa was a little bit more educated and she was lighter. Claudette was darker. Again, it just feeds into the narrative that they force upon people, right? Then, answering that last part about do men prefer lighter women or dark women? Again, this is a narrative. So if you remove the narrative and you go to each person case by case, right, you will see that men tend to go after women that are like their mothers based on what their experience was. So for me, I can keep it very real. I love women all shapes, all sizes, but I've always said I have a bias, and my bias is light skin, long hair. Doesn't mean I wouldn't talk to a chocolate honey, but I like light skin, long hair. Why is that? Because my mother is light skin and long hair, and my mother has been a source of safety, of love, and, and a compassion for me. So because that's what my mind associates love with, that's what I go to. But guess what? I have a cousin, right? And I'm, I'm not trying to put nobody's business out there, but his mother is light skin with long hair, and she was horrible. And he went through some crazy situations with his mom. And guess what? He cannot stand light skin girls. So, in, in there's many, it's like this, this, this whole thing is so layered. But when we just simplify it and say, ah, oh, no, I'll just like you because you light skin. And, and then there's another aspect to it, too. Uh-huh. This is the other part we're not talking about confidence, right? Women uh-huh, uh-huh. have been beat down on multiple levels, so much so that in order to find their own confidence, it's basically like, I can't, I can't, I, I don't even need a man at this point to have a level of confidence. And I, I'm going to wrap up because I don't want to be blown with it. So what ends up happening now is if a woman don't actually have the real confidence, she portray the illusion of confidence. She will put on the, the makeup. She will put on the clothes. She will take the perfect pictures on Instagram. She will give this illusion of confidence. But one thing men are great at is I know when you're really feeling yourself and I know when you're faking. And it will come out when I start talking mm-hmm. to you. When I start talking to you, there was things that you will say, things that you will show me that show mm-hmm. me, do you really love yourself and do you really not? And now, the darker woman is a victim of this narrative. So, for her, she don't even have the confidence. And so now, nobody going to want you if you don't even want yourself. If a dark skin honey come through the room and she... Have to force our way in by this quote-unquote confidence. So it's... Mm-hmm. I understand what the caller is saying, and I agree with um, a lot of the things that he said. But it's yeah. it's a narrative, yes, but it is it, it is something that is that people have to go through an experience as a as a mm-hmm. as a collective. Like I might not have that personal experience, but that doesn't mean because my experience was different that it negates the experience of the mass. So I think we have to be very um, cautious when we try to tie things in a neat bow and say, oh, with confidence, you know, if, if you walk right, if you walk in the room with your head held high, they're all going to come to you. Because that's not true. It's really not. Um, it's, it's not. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah just in, his his in, in, his defense, I, in his defense, he also said that the person will give, once they, once they start talking to you, it's something from within. He also did say that. Oh, yeah. So, but the thing is, yeah. it's, it's, it's a matter of you trying, to, you, you getting them to see you in a way to come to talk to you. So it's like I have to work for a basic conversation in a way that somebody else may not have to. So I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not rejecting everything that uh, the caller said, not at all. But I'm just saying that it's not as, it's not as, um. Uh, just the, the word will lose me, but it's not as minute as, oh, just be confident. And to say confidence, where do you get that confidence from, right? Yeah. Of course, you get it from within, but a lot of the times we get confidence from what we have been, what we've consumed, right? If I don't see myself on that screen, right? If whenever a role comes for a black woman, it's a, it's a, a um, 
an ambiguous black woman with a you know long straight hair or curly hair i don't see myself in her so i cannot gain confidence from looking at her because she does not reflect who i am so when those images are out there in the public that we see on a day-to-day -day basis it's hard for little dark skinned girls to 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 see themselves and people that look nothing like them yes there are uh uh, we've made games, of course. We can name a handful of dark-skinned Black girls who are winning, praise God, but that has not always been the case. I think for the younger girls, they're going to have someone, and, and that's a wonderful thing, but for a lot of us who grew up in, uh, who've grown up in this society, we're just now seeing our representation. So that confidence is coming from somewhere. So we have to be yeah. mindful of that as well. I just wanted to ask a quick question to piggyback on what you both, on the experiences you shared. Have you found, I know as compared to white, my white counterparts especially, or male counterparts, I've had this experience, but have you found that, yes, you had to work twice as hard um, as compared to a lighter skin sister, and then when you finally got that, that, um, you know, when you finally got the confidence or when you finally reached to where you needed to reach, all of a sudden now you're being suppressed and you're being told, oh, well, you think you're better than everybody else. Have you had that experience? Or do you feel that dark skin <laughs> girls in terms of that experience, Carter and Dorothy, um, do you feel that dark skin girls also experience where they have to work twice as hard and then when they end up, you know, reaching the level or catching up, to say to the light skin sisters or other counterparts um, who've had a you know a step ahead, do you feel that it, at that point you're then criticized for being too much or thinking you're better than? I would say that what I've noticed is that as, as far as the standard of beauty. I believe from what I've, I've experienced in life and what um, I've seen is that the standard of beauty is lower for, I don't want anybody to be offended, but this is what I've experienced, is lower for uh, light-skinned women than it is for dark-skinned women. There, It could be the most basic looking light-skinned girl ever, Ooh. right? And this girl is going to feel herself because she, you know, because, you know, at least she's light skinned or whatever. It's, there is, no, I'm not going to say that. Yeah. But when it's a dark skinned woman, she literally has to be stunning, like absolutely mm. stunning to even be classified as, oh, she's attractive. So I feel like the, when it comes to the hierarchy, like the beauty standard, I feel like dark skinned women have to be like just a 10 to receive a, a seven, like seven attention. Now, does that make a little bit of wow. sense? <laughs> well, I think it, it yeah, I, I, I definitely think that a dark skin woman definitely have to work. I think black women have to work hard period to get to certain levels. But I think that when it comes to darker skin women, it's, there's so much, there's so many more like the obstacle of appearance becomes something as well. Like I have to, like I have to look a certain way all the time. I can't, um, it's like, I can't just, just have a day where I just feel like, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, just have it. No, I have to be at the yeah. top of my game all the time. And I feel like sometimes that's not necessarily the case with other, with lighter skinned women. I mean, it happens to all of us, but I feel like, there's that social stigma. Like I have to represent all the dark skin girls out there. So I have to look, you know, my best all the time. So that's that's a little bit of what I've come to um, observation that I made as a, a dark skin woman. Okay. Um, okay. I, I want to get some last, I'm sorry, Clouder. I want to get some last oh, words yeah. from everybody before we wrap up the episode tonight. So I'll hear from you, Clouder, Gaina, Natalie, Juliet, before we wrap up, all right? Am I answering Juliet's question or I'm wrapping up? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, so just to make you back off uh, what um, your voice was saying, I definitely do feel that you do have to work more and always feel like you have to be on your A game. I know that personally for me, I'm already a perfectionist. So whatever I put out there as an yeah. image, I always feel like I have to polish it. It can't just be, you mm -hmm. know, you know, it's like, it's kind of like where you go to a process where you're like, should I tone it down? Like, what should I do? It's a set of questioning that you have to go through before you get your final look, the final product that you want to put out is usually. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to add yeah. to that conversation. Okay. And Claudia, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. You're as I think in general, as black women, um, I can't speak for black men, but in general, as black women, we have to always work 10 times harder. And listening to the, the different narratives, um, I may not understand how it feels for my darker brothers and sisters, but even I know that myself, um, I've had opportunities to get into um, white corporate America, and I've been the only black girl so I've had to always represent for my, I felt like my whole, my whole, my whole ethnicity, I've always had to be the one mm -hmm. to represent my black people. So I'm always, and, and this is by nature, I'm always punctual. I, 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 I like to speak proper. I always, that's just who I am. But I always feel like when I am in corporate America or when I'm around people, I'm always second guessing myself, like, am I, being too much? Should I change the way I'm acting? Am I acting too black? Am I acting, you know what I mean? Should I be, I'm always questioning and having to wonder, and it's always that obsessive, it doesn't get obsessive, but you're always ruminating like, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't, there's not one day that I can't come to work and not look, you know, at a 10, because I'm representing all my black brothers and sisters within my unit. Hmm. Um, so I, you know, I, I sort of feel the same way and I hear what Dorothy's saying, like, you know, um, but there's also another thing too, whether you're light skinned or dark skinned, there's like a whole body, you know, a physical aspect to it too. Like, are you a bigger light skinned girl or are you a skinnier light skinned girl? That within itself, mm. I always felt like it's different type of opportunities. Like if I'm a, if I feel like me, it's always been like, you know, if you have, a, like physically, you know, Dorothy, she's a beautiful, darker complexion than me, and she's thinner, way thinner. I always felt like those women got those, got like better opportunities because of their body size. And me, I was always mm. tossed to the side because I was a little bit thicker. So I think it's, there's layers to it. <laughs> and to just wrap up, I think, mm -hmm. Just this show, and I want to say thank you to Open Mic, is just, uh, um, and I'm sure the viewers and people who are who are going to be watching the show, it'll be an enlightenment for them because we touched on a lot of different topics. You know, it's not just the layers of our skin, but it's deeper um, and it's psychological, and there's a lot of healing that we need to do. And these things right here, these conversations, are the first steps to them. So thank you so much, Open Mic. Thank you, Ted. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Nadia. <clears throat> um, I want to hear from Gaina and Juliet. Um, yeah, so lots of thoughts. It's just enlightening, um, and mm -hmm. to say the least. Um, what can I say to wrap up? Um, this whole change in narrative thing that we're on, change in narrative, change in narrative, change in narrative, um, I guess we all agree that the narrative should change. Um, I guess what we don't agree on is how, how, how do we change this narrative? Yeah. You know, are, are mm -hmm. we going to get a collective together? Are we going to get some gatekeepers and we're going to like put some ideas in a box and put one? Are we going to vote on the best idea? Are we going to take a tally or vote? Whatever. whatever. How are we going to change this narrative? Um, also, this confidence thing, again, it, like Dorothy said, like, yes, we should all be confident, but still, there is something on a broader scale. Um, um, this confidence isn't always it, because I've definitely been, 
you know, at a party, confidence, because I'm Jamaican, I can dance, you know, I can, I can, I can dance. <laughs> and I'm doing my thing, I, I'm doing my thing. My, I was younger, my knees were, were, were like Megan Thee Stallion good. And, and <laughs> I was confident and all, all the people were looking at me but here goes Marcus over here with this white girl who can barely do anything. And I'm like, Marcus, uh. I know you want to dance. Why aren't why are you over there with Becky? Like, come on. So again, like that's on a whole that on 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 the wider scale isn't always the thing. Uh. Um I, I, that's just I guess my food or food for thought is gonna be like how do we change this narrative if we agree that it's supposed to change what what ideas are we going to put forward um to getting that done definitely thank you so much gaina and we'll take juliet and then dorothy okay i'm gonna say three points i'm gonna speak for the men since our host is not gonna speak for the men um I have a I have a dark skin father, so I'm just gonna give a little bit mm. from what I've seen. Said, don't take my shade, but shade. Um, <laughs> so I I think with women we're objectified, right? Sexualized, but with yeah. black men, I I think they are objectified in the same way. Um, and it may not always pertain to choosing a partner. I think dark skin men are the ones who are more sexualized mm. and objectified. Because, of course, black skin is seen as exotic in some places. And so, um, you know, when you see, uh, and no shade, a, a white person, a white woman who um, wants to be with a black man based on looks, not necessarily personality, sometimes it's based on that objectification, right? Um, uh -huh. You know, we hear stories of darker skinned kids being put in um, like zoos and stuff as an exhibit, uh -huh. right? And and that term of exoticness gets translated across. So I think for the men, there is this tussle. I don't know what it's like amongst them, but I know there's a level of objectification. I think it's that same objectification that causes them to be a higher target to police brutality, right? Where, mm -hmm. um, yes, a black man, no matter what shade they are, they have a target on their back. But I think when you're darker, there's more of this animalistic quality that's given to them, um, where mm -hmm. they're more of a threat. Um, so I'll just say that, that it, it, um, men, you can disagree with me in the comments and Ted probably won't disagree with me out loud. Uh, um, but I was just, I just wanted to share that because you know we, we didn't touch on the men and the reality is we don't understand their experiences but I think from my observation um, I think that's what it is um, the next thing is you know speaking to just hearing what Natalie said um, she did mention and I have to validate that she has mentioned that she's tried to show her support for you know, her darker skin sisters, and then it gets rejected. Correct me if I'm wrong. And mm -hmm. I think that's another layer um, with the whole trauma. In trying to, we, we need to stop trying to expect people to understand how we feel, right? Even, mm -hmm. for example, Slaughter and Dorothy, you're both beautiful dark skinned women. The reality is, you might be able to empathize with each other or understand what it's like but you will never mm -hmm. understand how each other feel. You'll never understand That's how right. the trauma sells for both of you. You'll never understand what the pain feels like for both of you. And and I think that's one solution um, because there that is another reality. We do it to Asians. We do it to Hispanic people where even, even white people, um, but I'll speak for the minorities, right? The people of color where an Asian can come to me and say, well, you know, it's wrong. Black lives matter. And then I want to, then I want to bring up, you know, the Asian cop that stood there and watched George Floyd pass away. Right. But the reality is it's this one Asian who came to me and validated how I'm feeling, but because I'm still looking for this validation where people know exactly how I feel. Now I'm like, you'll never know how I feel. You'll never understand this. 
But the reality is Asians were wrapped, they were round up and put in concentration camps too. For all these, mm -hmm. you know, trivial in the United States. And we don't understand right. that type of thing. We went through slavery. We went through a different, le and that's slavery for them. We went through a different level of bondage. So in the same sense, when it comes to the light skin versus dark skin, I would encourage my dark skin sisters who are watching the show um, to, if you do have a light skin sister that does come to you, trying to understand what their privilege is like, or trying to validate your beauty and validate your pain and support you know this movement for you because you do matter you do matter um when you see that i would encourage you as challenging as it is to also open your heart to receiving the fact that we do want to support you and we do hurt with you even though we don't know exactly how you feel um with that being said my third point as a black community y'all the reality is we're all hurting and we all need mm -hmm. to start approaching healing, right? And we, once again, need to stop comparing whose pain is worse than the others, right? Because if I know my dark skin sister is going through pain and I hit that time to, to now say, well, I go through pain too. It's the same gaslighting that white people do to us when they tell us all lives matter. All lives matter. And if, mm -hmm. if I'm a light skin person and I'm going through pain in this instant, as a black woman and my dark skin woman is saying, well, black, uh, darker skin woman, we go through pain too. We go through work. That is once again, uh, uh, gaslighting that the white community does. Make and I really want to challenge everybody. We all have a responsibility toward each other. The same way some of y'all couldn't sleep, some of y'all grieved, some of y'all mourned when you saw George Floyd's life pass away before your eyes in a span of eight minutes. That is the same pain you should feel when you when you see another one of your own, no matter what shade they are, being a victim, whether it's socially, socioeconomically. We need to understand that we share pain. It may not look the same, but it's pain. And so we should really be intentional about approaching our healing together as a community. And that's all I'm about to say. Amen. Thank you so much, Thank you. Julia. <laughs> the last words from Dorothy. That was a well said, Juliet. I don't know how to follow with that. <laughs> um, what I'll say is, I think the most important thing, and I believe uh, Juliet hit on it, is that we need to have empathy towards the situations that um, individuals and groups of people are experiencing. Um, since we're talking specifically about light skin privilege in this um, discussion, when that issue is raised up, if you are if you don't fall under the, under the category of dark skin, if you are light skin, it is the time to listen and to empathize with the 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 dark skin community for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. It's not the time to bring out exceptions or like Juliet reference, well, I'm not dark skin or I'm light skin, but I went through XYZ because it's taking away from the topic at hand. I think we can have mm -hmm. different discussions and that is okay. But when empathy comes into play, empathy is seeing what someone is going through and acknowledging it for what it is. And I think yeah. the only way that we can, we can bridge any kind of divide when it comes to colorism is to acknowledge that this particular group is going through something in a scale that might be different for me. And I don't have to compare struggles. I don't, acknowledging their struggle does not diminish mine. And I think that sometimes we, we kind of, we feel like, well, me, I, and that just, it, it does more harm than good because then it becomes whose struggle is worse. So I would just leave us with, just have that kind of empathy because when we look at just even outside of the, the black community, 
colorism is prevalent in the world. Yeah. Asian countries experience it, Latin countries yeah. experience it, African countries experience it, so on and so forth. So it's not yeah. it's it's not something that is um it's not an individual experience. It is something that is intrinsic within the world that we live in because whoever the colonizers, <laughs> they have put something within dark skinned individuals. They have created a narrative that is so potent that is experienced throughout the world. So when a dark skinned uh, brother or sister would, in whatever region of the world expresses that society is not in their favor and it's largely based on just how they look that is that that is something that is heavy it is not it's, it's something that should not be up for debate because historically speaking there's evidence to to back that up yeah. universally speaking it is something that is 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 undeniable so i think that to acknowledge that that is the first step and not to play hierarchy of struggles but to see what we have out there in front of us and acknowledge that yes in fact this particular group of people are experiencing something that i may not completely understand i may have a bit of understanding to you know what they're going through because i experience a form of it in and of itself but once again mm -hmm. just empathize with one another and each other's struggle and if we're discussing this particular um uh, uh topic let's discuss this topic right and yeah. let's finish that discussion and then we can move on to a different topic it's not it does once again it does more harm than good to compare uh experiences and compare struggles to find out which you know which one is valid and which one is not and um yeah that's basically all i have to say i thoroughly enjoyed this discussion and hearing it everybody's perspective it's always good to hear other people's perspective because that's how we grow and um once again uh it was, it was wonderful meeting you ladies and uh, hopefully we'll do this again sometime <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much ladies for being here for being vulnerable for opening up and sharing with us your experiences you know giving us your opinion on certain questions I know this was not an easy topic, right? And even for our audience watching here, I know some of them share those same struggles, frustrations as you guys on the panel. Unfortunately, Juliet, we don't have a lot of time for me to share my personal experiences with you guys. <laughs> that will probably require an entire episode. So stay tuned. But all good things must come to an end, guys. And once again, you are watching Drop Mic. I want to thank the technical team, JV, ND, Mina, Sephora, Pastor Shiloh, for putting this show together. Um, this is a platform for all of you guys to come on and discuss. Give us your genuine opinion on certain different topics, right? Relevant topics, hot topics, current events and situations. And I want to thank our ladies once again for being with us tonight. Once again, you're watching Drop Mic. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good night.